Welcome to the Elements of Science. I'm Abigail from Research and Knowledge Exchange at the Mind Foundation, and today's topic is depression, one of the silent tragedies of our world. Some form of it affects up to one in six people at some point in their lifetime, and because it is both common and debilitating, depression causes more disability worldwide than nearly any other disease. Depression is so insidious because its symptoms all undermine the joy that people otherwise get out of life. People with depression will lose interest in things that they once really enjoyed, and they can feel numbed to everything, especially to anything good. They can also feel constantly exhausted and drained, which leads to trouble concentrating and doing routine daily tasks. And depression compels people to get very hard on themselves. They have thoughts that they're worthless or that they've let themselves and others down or don't even deserve happiness. And when there's no end of this in sight, patients with severe depression may even think of suicide. Trying to understand where all of this comes from is complicated because there's more than one way to get depression. But mental health professionals have identified several factors that play a role. One of these is genetics, although there's not one determinative depression gene. Dozens of different genes affect someone's risk. Chronic illnesses can also sometimes bring depression with them, especially when they drastically reduce someone's quality of life. And stressful or traumatic events can contribute as well. This means both ongoing stress and acute events, and also events that took place long ago. Being lonely can also really take a toll on people, enough to push them toward depression. A lack of social support can make someone more susceptible to multiple mental health problems. All of these factors and more affect someone's biochemistry, and they can interact with each other to create a complex system of disease. Biochemical changes include changes in the serotonin system, neuroinflammation, and neuroplasticity. Once someone is diagnosed with depression, their options include medication and therapy. Therapy is particularly suitable for people who have difficult life circumstances which are contributing to their depression, so people who don't just have a chemical imbalance. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most effective types, but each person has to find what works for them. Additionally, some people may benefit from medication, and the first line of treatment is usually a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but these don't always work, so doctors may also suggest previous generations of antidepressants as an alternative. In recent years, ketamine has also been used as a fast-acting treatment for severe depression, although it can't be used too often. And especially for patients with treatment-resistant depression, recent research suggests that psychedelics, particularly psilocybin, may improve depression by targeting both its biochemical and cognitive causes. That's why the Mind Foundation will soon be conducting a study on psilocybin therapy for depression, starting in 2021. If you'd like to learn more about depression and psychedelic therapy, you can visit our website, or the Mind Academy, and our blog. You can also browse this reference list. Until next time, on the Elements of Science.